There is no institution, there is no structure like the church of the living God. I want everybody to get their Bibles in hand, please. And uh, one scripture that we will turn to is a noted passage that is found in St. Matthew chapter number 16. And it has been impressed upon me to go back and share this message with this congregation. <clears throat> And if God would have me to share it with others, then we want to be prepared to do just that. Uh, the old saints used to say that everything is going down but the church. And uh, they would remind us that the world is going down. They would remind us that everything that can be shaken will be shaken. And the only thing that is going to remain is that which is built upon the word of God. When we talk about the church, people of God, we are talking about that, again, which has been designed and instituted by God. I oftentimes use the illustration uh, as far as construction that you can build, and whatever you build today, it becomes old tomorrow. Whatever you build today, it is only new for a moment once and really a lot of times we talk about new building materials and sometimes you can purchase material brand new but it is really used because it's been sitting out in the lumber yard somewhere weather beaten they have already been rained on without being covered up and things of that nature and then they drop it off do your favor and drop it off to the work site when they drop it off to the work site it sits there in the elements so that new construction is really not as new as you think it is. Amen, somebody. A brand new car you buy already got at least a mile on it. And many times it have a few, a handful of miles on it. None of you have ever bought a brand new car and the odometer said zero, zero, zero. You bought a brand new car and it said five, six, eight, and some 13. Why? That car has already been driven, which means it's used. You paid brand new money for a used car. <laughs> but everything that man makes, it not only gets old, but it deteriorates. It's just a matter of time. The clothes that you wear, the shoes that you purchase, all you have to do is look at them. After one day, they become wrinkled. And they have uh, germs and stuff inside because you slipped your foot inside of it. And you take it back if you want to. You've already worn it. And proves that stuff wears out. Look at the bottom of your shoes. The sole of your shoes are worn. The heels are worn down. Somebody said you walked funny. You said you don't believe it. Just look at your shoes. The heels of your shoes will show you how you walk because they'll wear out in certain areas. Amen. And uh, the clothes we wear, the furniture we buy. You know, I, I was growing up and my dad told us as little toddlers when he purchase a brand new uh, sofa and uh, the love seat to go along with it as well as the sitting chair. My dad uh, helped us to understand that this has to last you. And my dad told us it has to last a lifetime. <laughs> so we learn how to sit on a sofa, not plop down on one. You know, some folks just go to a sofa and they just plop down on it. No, we learn to sit with ease. I still know how to sit on a sofa today. Uh, we d could not just go in the living room and eat and drink. And uh, that sofa lasted me as far as I can remember in my childhood. Then they gave it away to somebody else to use. 
but even when it was purchased brand new, they had that plastic cover over it. You know, that, that, would, that, that, that was to help it last. But as time went on, that plastic got old. And it just voluntarily began to tear. Now, at times, we may have helped it, you know, sometimes subconsciously, just, you know, grab it and help it tear. And I remember that plastic coming off of that sofa, just only to remind me that no matter how well you try to take care of it, it still gets old. And I don't know where it's at now, if after all these years it's still sitting up in somebody's house or if it went to the curb to go to the uh, trash site. The point is, everything gets old and it will not last. You can get a facelift, you're still getting old. And there's certain ways you can tell. You know, they pull skin and they stretch it and they pin it back in certain places. I'm not trying to, you know, I'm not trying to disappoint you. I'm just, you know, because you paid money to get that done. And I, and I understand there's nothing wrong with that. And, and I'm really not trying to, trying to be offensive, but I'm just trying to remind you, you still get old. You still get old. But when it comes to the church of the living God, that is one institution that, yes, it gets older, but it never wears out. Today I want to share with you seven things about Christ and his church. And I want you to go with me and bear with me for a little while, and then we're going to let you go. But seven things about Christ and his church. The word church is generally defined from its most noted Greek word, ecclesia. Ecclesia. Many of you have heard that word. You've been coming to church for a little while. You know, you heard the preacher get up and give you some Greek and they sound deep and you say, whoa. But it's, it's not all that deep. Everybody say ecclesia. Lord have mercy. So just try that on some church goers sometime this week. Just walk up to them and say, Ecclesia. That's a Greek word for church. And it simply means, in its most uh, perhaps plain term, called out ones. It means a crowd or a gathering of people. In particular, the church is a group of people that have gathered together for religious purposes or they have gathered together as a body of believers in some way to celebrate Jesus Christ. It is also in its broad sense is inclusive, not of just a local congregation, but all believers as a, as a whole, which ultimately makes up what is called the universal church. When we talk about the universal church, we're not limiting that definition to any one group or denomination. We're not limiting it to the Roman Catholic Church because they and in, they in and of themselves as a church denomination consider themselves as the universal church. But that could not be so when we deal with the true word ecclesia. Ecclesia would deal with born again believers all across this world that have ever lived, that is living, and that ever will live. But keep in mind, when we talk about that word, that you are dealing with called out ones. And that word call also has reference to those who are chosen, which we would deal with a little bit later in our message. But I don't want you to uh, miss the very fact that they were called out. So underline that thought or that word in your mind or in your notes if you are taking notes. Ecclesia. In this case, we are dealing with today this local assembly. We are a local assembly, which means that we are believers 
that make up the universal church as the body of Christ. But here today, my assignment is to this local assembly. And the reason being is that because believers are spread about across the globe. So we all cannot attend a local place all together at one time. So God raises up pastors and shepherds to oversee a local assembly. So you and I today here at Power, Hope, and Grace Bible Church, we are the ecclesia for this block, for this corner, between these four walls. But we are a part of the ecclesia that assists in making up the rest of the ecclesia. And the church say amen. <laughs> first thing I want to remind you today about the Church of Christ is that Christ himself builds this church. Not only does he build the church, but he is responsible for the church. This church is an institution. It is an institution comprised of many believers and believers with many different functions. And this is what assists in making it an institution. So number one, Christ is the one that builds this church. Christ is the one that is responsible for the existence of the church. Matthew 16 and 18, as you know, has that noted passage where Jesus comes to his disciples and says, Who do men say that I am? They begin to remind him. Some say that thou art uh, Elias. Uh, some say that thou art Isaiah. Some say that thou art Jeremiah. Some say that you are John the Baptist. Come back uh, to the uh, earth. Uh, come back from the dead. Jesus says to his disciples, well, whom do you say that I am? Peter speaks on behalf of all of the disciples, apostles. He says that thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus turns around and responds to Peter and says to Peter, this is a very powerful truth. And upon this rock, I will build my church. Verse number um, 18. He says it this way. And I say unto thee, that thou art Peter. And upon this rock, I will build my church. Everybody look at that two-letter word, my. Everybody say my. my. Whose church? Jesus said, I will build my church. And the church that I build for me the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, we've shared with you in previous messages, even in 2011, that when we talk about the gates of hell, we're dealing with the uh, influence of uh, the enemy, the tactics of uh, the enemy that will try to overthrow the church of God, in particular through false doctrine and false teaching. Jesus said, whatever Satan conjures up, he is not going to prevail against my church. Notice what Jesus did not say. He did not say that Satan won't come against my church. He did not say that Satan will not try to overthrow my church. He did not say that Satan would not be an adversary to my church. But what he does say is that Satan will not prevail. The gates of hell shall not prevail against what? My church. My makes it personal, becomes a personal possession. So the church belongs to Jesus, and Jesus is the one that builds his church, and Jesus said nothing is going to prevail against it because I myself have instituted it. So it's important for us to understand, people of God, uh, that no man builds a church. That's why as men, we have to be careful about what we call our personal ministry. Hmm. I'll come back to that later. You're not ready for that just yet. I'll come back to it. Number two concerning Christ in this church is Christ paid a price for his church. And the price he paid was he purchased the church by his own blood. If you're going to build a house or a building, one of the things that you must do is be able to claim ownership to the land. 
You cannot build on property and you don't own the property. That's illegal. Can I get a witness here? You don't believe that? You go on, you try, you go ahead and build a house on uh, that vacant lot three doors down from you and you build a house on there, you will lose the house because you don't own the property. So you would have spent monies in vain. Jesus said, this church is mine, and I want to show you how much this church is mine, is that I own this church, and I have all rights, I have uh, all rights and privileges to this church because I purchased this church. Acts chapter number 20, verse number 28, when Paul gathers all of the elders of Ephesus together, he reminds them when he was given his farewell message to them in Acts chapter 20, verse number 28. He says, take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock. So Paul said to the shepherd, take heed to yourself, examine yourself, make sure you are where you're supposed to be as uh, men of God. Then I want you to pay attention to the flock, which you are over and you have been placed over this flock by the Holy Ghost. It is the Holy Ghost that have made you overseers. And your responsibility is to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Now, I want you to catch that. Remember, every shepherd that is ever called, they are called not to pastor their church. They are called to pastor the church of Jesus Christ and that local assembly that the Lord allowed to be raised up in that particular area. And their job is twofold, one, to oversee the flock, and two, to feed the flock. So that becomes one of the ultimate responsibilities of a shepherd. That is to oversee, to make sure that the flock is guarded, to make sure that the flock is protected from the things that the enemy is trying to throw at them. And one of the ways to oversee them and protect them from the things that the enemy is throwing at them is by feeding them the word of God. So Jesus Christ, who builds the church, chooses the shepherds to oversee the church, gives the shepherd their responsibility of how to oversee the church, and then supplies them as shepherds with what is needed so the church can be taken care of. And that is the word of God, because the Bible and the word belongs to God. Can I get an amen? So Jesus said, the reason I want you to do this is because I purchased this church and I'm building this church and I am establishing this church and I purchased it by my blood. When you, from a natural standpoint, spend money on something that is valuable, it should mean something to you. You should not just haphazardly handle it you should not just haphazardly look after it. If it is something that is valuable, then that means it is dear to one's heart. So the church of Jesus Christ that is being built by Jesus Christ has been purchased by his blood. He shed his blood and he's concerned about his church. And to remind you, and which we will remind you on a few occasions throughout the rest remaining of this message that the church when we talk about the church, the ecclesia, we are not limiting the church, even though it is referred to sometimes as brick and mortar or a building or a place. We are talking about individual believers that make up the church or the body of Christ. So you and I, as called out ones, we make up the ecclesia. We gather together and when we gather together, and this is why we have to be careful sometime about saying, when somebody asks us, well, where are you getting ready to go? I'm getting ready to go to church. That may be partially true, but it's not that you're getting ready to go to church. You are the church that is getting ready to gather with the rest of the church. So wherever we go, we can have church. I told you one of the last times that I hit on this uh, lesson last year that uh, 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 this is why as believers, wherever we go, we're supposed to be believers. When we go on vacation, we don't vacate from being believers. 
We are believers 24-7. Can I get an amen? amen? Everywhere we go. At home. In the mall. At the restaurant. In the barn. Behind the barn. In the woods. Makes no difference where we're at. Down by the lake. Out at Belle Isle. We're still supposed to be the church. Can I get a witness up in here today? So Jesus paid for this church. And remember he says this in 1 Corinthians chapter number 6, verse number 19 and 20. Those very powerful words that the apostle Paul reminds the church of the living God. He said, what? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? Called out believers. You are a body as a believer and in you dwells the Holy Spirit. And he said, the Holy Spirit which is in you, he says, not only that, but you have that Holy Spirit because of what God has done for you, and you are not your own. That's why Jesus could say, my church. No one can truthfully say, my church, and be and get away with it except Jesus Christ himself. He says, my church. Now, yes, when we say our church by identifying our local gathering place, and there's nothing wrong with that, but we have to remember the church all belongs to Jesus. Every believer belongs to Jesus. Even though I shepherd this congregation, you all in uh, uh, a major spiritual sense are not my people. You belong to Jesus Christ. Just as I belong to Jesus Christ. We may have various functions in the body of Christ, but we belong to him. And as a direct result of belonging to him, we then belong to one another, which we'll talk about that just shortly. And notice what uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses uh, 16, and then verse number 20 minds us. Verse number 20 reminds us this. It says, for you are bought with a price. When you buy something, then you claim ownership. Is that right? That card is getting old. When you purchase it, whose name is on that title? Yours and the dealer's until you pay it off. But once you pay it off, that title, you have what is called clear title. And when you have clear title, that means that vehicle belongs to you. And you say, my car. And, you know, we've been saying my car before we end up paying it off. You know, so it might be better to say, hey, Doc, can I borrow that dealer's car you riding in? <laughs> Lord, have, but when you get clear title, you can show sure enough say, my keys, my car. You can claim ownership. Well, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So being the temple of the Holy Spirit as a believer, we do not belong to us nor do we belong to anybody else in that sense. We belong to the one who said, my church. And Jesus Christ said, I will build my church. So every believer that has been purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ is a part of his church. So he owns us. So if he owns us, then none of us can walk like we want to walk. None of us can talk like we want to talk. None of us can do what we want to do because we don't belong to us, we belong to him. So if we belong to him, then we have to walk like he wants us to walk. We have to talk like he wants us to talk. We have to live like he wants us to live because we've been purchased. We've been bought with a price. And as a result of being bought with a price, we are therefore to glorify God in our bodies, which are his temple. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19 says this, For as much, I'm trying to tell you the Lord paid for you. He paid for you. He said, for as much as you know. And I wonder how many know. That you were not redeemed with corruptible things. <laughs> such as silver and gold. You weren't redeemed by silver and gold from your corruptible conversation or your worldly lifestyle, which you received from the Adamic nature. 
He said, but you were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ. And he was as a lamb that was slain without spot or blemish. So this is why coming to church, we must ever be reminded, coming together together, we must ever be reminded that we are here not because we were so good, so wonderful, so pleasant, so pretty, so cute, or handsome. None of that factors into the reason we're here today. I just thought I'd remind you, but we are here because the Lord purchased us with his blood. If somebody would have brought a hundred ounces of gold, you still would not have been able to be purchased from sin. And that would not have lasted. But it took the Lamb of God without spot. You ought to read 1 Peter chapter 1, in particular verses 18 through 22 when you get a chance. And the verses we quoted to you today is from 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 18 and verses 19. So we are bought, which means we belong to him. A price was paid. The third thing I want to remind you about Christ and his church is that his church is built upon him. Now that's important. He, what that is saying is that Christ is the very foundation of his church. Now it doesn't get any better than that. That, that must mean that Christ is somebody. He builds his church, he purchases his church, and then he builds the church upon himself. The Bible teaches us in Ephesians chapter 2, in particular verses 16 to verse number 22. Write that down, please. It reminds us that Christ is the chief cornerstone. It tells us that we are built, that we have been reconciled to him, and the way that we have been reconciled to him is that we are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Now, that is important, but before I hit on that, let me remind you that everybody that is brought into the church, we are brought into the church as a unified body. The middle wall of petition have been broken down. We have been reconciled, whether we are Jews or whether we are Gentiles, whether we are black, whether we are white, it makes no difference. We have all been brought into the body of Christ by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And nobody has a monopoly on that because the Bible said that we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I don't care where you came from or where you think you're going. I don't care what you have or don't have. I don't care what you had. I don't care what you lost. I don't care what you're looking to gain. None of that means anything. We are all one in Jesus Christ. And we are built upon the foundation now. The scripture says that Christ is the chief cornerstone. And I love that, not just the cornerstone. He's the chief cornerstone. And what that means in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 16 through 22, read it when you have time. What that means is that the church could not be the church if it was not for Christ. That door you walked into this building today is on what is called hinges. You remove those hinges and see what happens. If those hinges are moved, even though that door, when you initially approached it, may look like a door, and may look like you could pull it and walk through it, you fool around and walk up to that door without hinges and pull it, that door liable to fall on you. In other words, it is the hinges that assist the door in being able to operate or function as a door. You go to that car dealership and look at that brand new car. Smell good, look good, shining. But if you open that hood up and that car has no engine under that hood, then that car is nothing but a shiny piece of metal, per se. Why? Because it takes that motor in that car. That is what really, that's what the car really is. It's that motor that gives it the ability to do what it does. Other than that, it's just a pretty glossy piece of machine. Paul says that Christ, 
church is built, it hinges off of him. You take your body and snatch your heart out. I promise you, you won't live. It is the heart that the blood flows to and the blood flows from that causes you and I to be able to operate and live. So what would the church be without Christ? Paul says in that passage in Ephesians chapter uh, 2, he says, for through him, we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Who is the him? The him is Christ. Through Christ, we have access by the spirit to the Father. He says, as a direct result of that, no longer are we strangers and foreigners, but we are fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and we are built upon that foundation. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building is fitted and framed and put together. A house without a foundation, Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 7, when the wind blows and the storm comes, that house is not going to stand. I just stop out here to remind you today, you need Jesus. You got to have him. You got to have him. Jesus said in St. John 15, verse 5, he said, I am the vine, you are the branches. said, he that abides in me and I in him, the same shall bring forth much fruit. Then he said, without me, you can do nothing. So the church is built on Christ. Oh, bless his name. Everything. See, it is in him that we live, that we move and have our being. The fourth thing I want to tell you is that Christ started this church at Pentecost. So if, everybody, uh, or, or if anybody is ever going to build, you got to have a starting point. You can have a plan and a design in your mind, but sooner or later, you got to get the material. You got to get the land. You got to get the property. And you got to start putting things together. So in St. Matthew chapter 16, Verse number 18, Jesus said, I will build my church, future tense. Now, there's a lot of discussion and debate uh, concerning when the church started. And I think that it is clear uh, to me that the church started at Pentecost. And the reason I say the church has started at Pentecost is because when you begin to look at Acts chapter number 2, verses, in particular verses 41 through verse 47, and when you get to verse... 47, that is the first time that you see the word church mentioned outside of the Gospels is in Acts chapter 2, verse 47. And it says in Acts 2, verse 47, that after Pentecost, or on the day of Pentecost, after the 120 believers were baptized with the Holy Spirit, that there was added the same day 3,000 believers to the church. And in verse 47, that's what it said. They were added to the church. And the second reason that I believe the church started at Pentecost, because in St. John chapter number 16, Jesus tells his disciple, he said, listen, you all, I got to go away. And the reason I have to go away is so that the comforter could come. And when the comforter comes, he's going to lead you and guide you into all truth. And when the comforter come, the comforter is not going to be limited to time and space as I have limited myself in my human body to time and space. So when this comforter comes, this comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, is going to begin to fall on men and women everywhere. That's why Peter preaches in Acts chapter number 2. You remember what Peter preached, don't you? Peter says uh, that this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last day, said the Lord, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters, they shall prophesy. I'm going to pour it out on young men. I'm going to pour it out on handmaidens. You're going to have young men uh, that are going to see visions and old men that are going to dream uh, dreams. So what he's saying is that when I pour out my spirit, my spirit is going to touch people of all different kind of walks of life, wherever they may be. Then uh, Paul preaches in 1 Corinthians chapter number 12. He said, and by one spirit are you all baptized into one body. And uh, we have the outpouring of the Holy Ghost that takes place in uh, Acts chapter number 2. 
The next thing that we must consider is that if Jesus says in Matthew 16 and 18, I will build, that's future tense. Then when he goes on to say, and I purchased the church with my own blood, that meant something had to happen first before the church could begin. And what is it that had to happen first? His blood had to be shed because the church is purchased by his blood. So once the price is paid, if you're building a house, you got to put a down payment on before you can have material shipped to your property. I wish I had somebody in here that wouldn't sleep on me today. So Jesus, before he built the church and put the church together, he paid the price for the church. That was his blood. And on the day of Pentecost, he started putting the pieces of the church together. He started with 120. You know, the 11 was up there. Mary, the mother of Jesus, was up there. All of them was up there. In Acts chapter number 2, verses 1 through 4, it says, And when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there comes a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and filled the house where they were sitting. And they all were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in different languages as the Spirit of God gave the utterance. And then that's when Peter goes on to preach, says this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. We get down to verse number 41 that Peter preached and there were 3,000 believers that responded to the message and in verse number 47, and the Lord added. So the Lord built the church in one day. I just thought I ought to tell you. Built it in one day and then add an addition on in the same day. It's his church. He do whatever he wants with his church. Fifth thing that I want to tell you is that Christ is the head of his church. Which means that he operates and controls the church. Whose church is it? Come on, help me preach a little while and say, neighbor, it's Jesus' church. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 22 tells us this. And God the Father hath put all things under his feet. That's Jesus' feet. And gave him to be the head. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm going somewhere and I'll be there probably in about seven minutes. And gave him to be the head over, and, and, and read, read, read this when, when, when you get a chance, over all. Yeah, 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 yeah. You can't miss that one three letter word. Over all the church. Everything belonged to him. You belong to him. I belong to him. Our eyes belong to him. Our hands belong to him. Our feet belong to him. Our mouth belong to him. Our heart belong to him. Everything we got belong to him. This and that belong to him. It doesn't make a difference. Well, this building belongs to him. The carpet on the floor belongs to him. The pews belong to him. Because without him, we would be nothing. Oh, bless his name. That house you got belonged to him. That's why that house is supposed to be sanctified, y'all. We're supposed to be able to drive by that house. And know that house has been marked by the sign of the Holy Ghost. All and any and every kind of thing that ain't supposed to be going on at that house. Because that house belonged to Jesus. Because believers live in that house. Let the record reflect, I got about seven amens. The Father, look at this, had put all things under his feet, made him the head over everything. The church, which is his body. Mm, mm, mm. And the church assists in making up the fullness of Christ, who fills all and all. Ephesians chapter 5, 23 reminds us this. It says, for the husband 
is the head of the wife. Now, there, there's some people in the 21st century, they want to erase this out of the Bible. There are people, when you're having a marital ceremony, and they turn around and says to the wife, will you obey your husband? They don't want you to say that. I have had and seen people ask the preacher, can you not say that? Oh, I'm preaching good. <laughs> I have asked them. I've had people, I said, no, I, I, I ain't taking that out. Stop. Leave me alone. I've had people say, well, do I, do, do, do I have? So I told you before, one pastor asked this couple that said, uh, she had asked him, can you take it out? And uh, uh, he said, well, let me ask you a question. He said, uh, now, do you respect him? She said, yes. Do you plan on respecting him? Yes. He said, so if you respect him, will you obey him? She said, <gasps> so that was his way of letting her know, no, I'm not taking it out. Now, but here, here is, here is, did I, did, did I lose y'all? <laughs> now, I, I'm in the Bible. The Bible says the husband, the husband, the male, the man, and no woman can be a husband. For the husband is the head of the wife. Even as just like on the same uh, type of setup as Christ is the head of the church. And then he says, Christ shows how he is the head of the church because he saves the body. Christ is the savior of the body. So Christ being the savior of the body means that he's responsible for the body. Everything the body needs, Christ sees to it that the body has. Huh. Christ guides the body. Christ protects the body. And Christ dies for the body. So to every husband who is the head, there's a price. In other words, you ain't the head just because you're a man. You're the head because you paid a price. Oh. So if it come down to dying, you got to put yourself out there first, bro. That's why it's always better for you to have more on your insurance policy. So if you die first, the family can be taken care of. Now, I wish I had a witness here. See, Christ died and went to glory, and the church is still being taken care of. So when you die, leave a good insurance policy so your family can still be taken care of. Your insurance policy will act as an advocate. More on that later. Number six, the church is the body of Christ. And as his body, the church is an extension of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through 14 reminds us, uh, for as the body is one that has many members, and all the members of that one body are many, yet they are one body. So also is Christ. Remember, by that one spirit, we're baptized into that body. But what Christ does is makes us members in particular and gives us various gifts so we can operate and function. This is why when it comes to every member and every gift in the body, no gift is for the purpose of superseding or shining above and beyond others for the purpose of drawing attention to that one particular member and their gift and voiding or pushing aside the gifts of other members. No member is ever to do that. I don't care how large you, you may grow to 10,000 members, you still ain't nothing but a slave for Christ. Mm. Oh, bless his name. That's all we all are. We may be dressed up slaves, we may be sharp slaves, 
We may be pinstripe wearing slave. We may be long dress wearing slave. We may be $75 hairdo slave. It doesn't matter. Let us be good looking slave for the Lord Jesus Christ. For we are his body and he is our head. And we are an extension that is to be used to his honor and his glory. We got one more thing I want to tell you. The seventh thing about Christ and his church is that Christ chooses both those who are to be members of his church as well as the method of how they become members. It's his church. In that it's his church, he can choose who he wants to be in the church and how he wants them to get in the church. My question to you today is, are you in his church? Scriptures such as St. John 15, 16 reminds us, the words of our Lord to his disciples, you have not chosen me, but I've chosen you and ordained you. And then I've given you a responsibility that you should go forth and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. Then whatever you ask of me, of my father, since you were in my church and came in the way I wanted you to come in and doing what I asked you to do, you can ask my father and whatever you ask my father, I'll give it to you. Who wouldn't want to be in a church like this? <laughs> Woo, bless his adorable name. Passages like Romans chapter 8, 29 and 30 reminds us, for whom he foreknew. So don't come in here acting like the Lord didn't know you. He know who you were, where you were, what you were doing, and how many times you did it. He the one that called you out of that mess. Can I get a witness here today? But I love this. This scripture goes with me. When the devil try to talk to your mind, just tell him Romans 8, 29 and 30. Where he says, for whom he foreknew, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his dear son. Isn't that wonderful? That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. So every time the enemy come to you and tell you you ain't nothing, just Romans 8. 29. <clears throat> Not only am I part of the ecclesia, Lord have mercy, but I've been specially chosen. And I've been chosen through the foreknowledge of God. That's why none of us have a right to say, I wish I'd never been born. It's too late now, you hear? And if you are a born again believer, you can thank God because through God's foreknowledge, he knew that you and I were going to be here and gave us an opportunity to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ came and saved us from a world of sin. And through that foreknowledge, he predestinated that we be conformed to the image of himself. Now we've been glorified. The method can be found in scripture such as Mark 16, 15, where it says, he said unto them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to everybody. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. So you got to believe that Jesus is the builder of the church. You got to believe that the church belongs to him. Because every other institution is going down. Did you not know that even marriages don't last forever? You know how to say, and they lived happily ever after? No, somebody going to die on somebody. And then in heaven, there won't be marriage like we know down here. Oh, I'm sorry if I, you, you know, messed up. But that's, that's, that's Bible. Now, we are to live together and stay together until death separates us apart. 
And that's death without murder. Can the whole congregation say, just say, just say amen? <laughs> so the method is a person got to believe. St. John 1 and 12 said, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believed on his name. So you got to receive what you believe. 1 Corinthians 12, 13a reminds us, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. St. John chapter 14, verse number 6, Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. If you want to have a relationship with the Father, you got to come to the church. So I remind you today, saints of God, that Christ builds his church. He's responsible for the existence of it. He, he instituted it. Christ paid a price for his church, his precious blood. Christ builds his church on himself. Christ started his church at Pentecost. So that's why you can't be a part of the church without the Holy Spirit. Christ is the head of his church. Ain't nobody else in control. Did y'all hear what I said? The Roman Catholic Church ain't in control. The Pope is not in control. Archdiocesis, bishop, whoever it may be, they're not in control. Said the organization is not in control. Ain't no organization that ever was invented or came up is in control of this church. Jesus is in control. And he operates and controls the church like he wants to operate it and like he wants to control it. The church is his body. He has invited us in to be members of that body and to be an extension of his church. And he chooses how we join this church. You don't join the church of the living God by signing the card. You do this for our records. And by the way, if you haven't signed one and you claim to be a member, get one of these and sign it. Put your name on it. Now, that card doesn't assure that you are going to heaven. What assures that you're going to heaven is that you believe in Jesus Christ. Shaking the preacher's hand doesn't do it. You got to believe in the gospel. That is why we must understand that the church must always be about Christ. Every time we embark upon this building, we ought to have the Lord on our mind. Every time we come up in here, it should not be how much we've been worn down by the cares of this life and the frustrations of traveling back and forth over the dangerous streets and highways and what our boss did or what our boss didn't do. When we come in this building, we should have Jesus on our mind. I wish I had a believer in here today. Say, when we gather, we must say, Lord, this is your house. I want you to have sovereign control. I want you to do what you want to do and how you want to do it and when you want to do it. The church is not about how many programs we come up with, not how many seminars we have, not how many musical concerts we have, not how many athletic programs we put together, not how many games or bazaars or fairs or plays or skits or dramas. That is not what the church is all about. Even though these things might have their place in the church, the church is all about Jesus Christ and him crucified. Can I get a better witness than that today? As I close and go to my seat, I want to remind you that Christ must be brought back in his church. When the preacher comes in, he should not get the best standing ovation in the service. When the name of Jesus Christ is called, the saints of God should allow him. They should allow him. They should allow him because he is in control. I wish I had just about 10 believers up in here in Power, Hope, and Grace Bible Church that understood what I was trying to say. When the preacher preach, he must preach about Jesus. When the singers sing, they must sing about Jesus. When the praise service goes on, and we must testify about Jesus. Can I get a witness here today? When we pray... We must pray to Jesus and pray in the name of Jesus. When the usher usher, they shall usher people to their seat in the name of Jesus. Can I get a witness here? We have to get to the place where we don't come with our carnal agendas uh, trying to pacify folk. We've been pacified uh, too long. Uh, 
the last I looked at it, Jesus Christ is still the answer for the world today. Somebody shout yes, yes, yes. Woo! Lord have mercy. Let us not be caught up with this new wave stuff. Let us not be caught up with the modern church uh, that centers around the person and the people uh, as opposed to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, let us not be more excited about programs that are born out of the idea uh, of man's ideologies and his own uh, fleshly mindset. Uh, but let us respect the church of the living God uh, and keep it as a priority in our life. Uh, we should never put worldly things above the church, uh, including money, uh, cars, houses, land, uh, and the daily cares of this life. Uh, for stuff and things can never bring us over. Uh, but I heard the saints of yesteryear used to see, uh, as long as I got King Jesus, Oh, yes, as long as I got King Jesus, you can have the whole wide world, but give me Jesus. Can I get a witness here today? Thank you, Holy Ghost. We are never to take man-made relationships and put them above the church. Because if you never get a friend, you have a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. And his name... Woo, Lord, have mercy, it's Jesus. Jesus Christ uh, went through extreme measures for his church. Uh, the church belongs to him. Uh, it was purchased by him, uh, shedding his blood at Calvary. Uh, he paid the price, uh, and that's why we got to bring the cross uh, back into the church. Uh, preach the cross, uh, for it was at the cross uh, where the Savior of the church uh, shed his blood. Uh, it was at the cross uh, where the burdens of our sins rolled away. Uh, it was at the cross, uh, Lord have mercy, that reached way back in the past uh, and uh, in the, the future uh, to save mankind. Uh, what I just saying, Jesus established the church uh, on the surest foundation possible uh, and that was himself uh, this is why he made us born again believers uh, of his body uh, an extension of himself uh, and as the head of his body uh, our salvation is assured uh, in christ uh, for he knows what we don't know uh, he can see what we can't see uh, he can hear our faintest cry he can speak to us through his word he can comfort us 